Good morning. Good morning, everybody. And uh, I'd like to welcome, welcome everybody to this morning's uh, hearing and uh, oversight hearing on energy installations uh, in the environment for fiscal year 19. Uh, it's great to see that the fiscal year 2019 budget request uh, of $11.4 billion for military construction and family housing, uh, including OCO, uh, is an increase of $1 billion or 9.6 percent over or above fiscal year 2018 budget request and uh, about $558 million above the fiscal year 18 uh, enacted level. Uh, so hopefully uh, this increase uh, will address uh, some of the most urgent construction needs uh, within uh, the services. Uh, the bipartisan budget agreement uh, modified the discretionary spending caps uh, imposed by the BCA for fiscal years uh, 2018 and 2019. Uh, which I'm sure was a great relief to all in this room. Uh, the committee's uh, still concerned how force structure changes will affect uh, the military construction budget in fiscal year 2019 uh, and beyond. Uh, another high profile issue is the European Deterrence uh, Reassurance Initiative, uh, which our allies are very interested in and for which uh, the fiscal year 2019 uh, budget request includes $936.6 million for 11 countries. Uh, last, we have uh, all a keen interest in managing our facilities uh, better in terms of requirements versus capacity, uh, both overseas and in, in the United States. The panel before us today has a lot of answers uh, uh, to these questions, I'm sure. Uh, but before I introduce our witnesses, I'd like to turn to the ranking member, my friend and colleague from Florida, Ms. Debbie Wasserman Scholes, for any opening remarks uh, that she might like to make at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I I'm pleased that we're going to be able to talk about the President's 2019 military construction budget request today. And while we normally have the civilian leadership here, uh, we are really thrilled to have the distinguished service members who are able to join us so you can help explain military construction priorities and services. Um, as you all know, we are once again functioning under another two-year budget compromise passed by Congress earlier this year. The budget compromise raised the FY 2018 defense spending level from $549 billion to $629 billion, which is an $80 billion increase. And for the second year of the deal, it provides an $85 billion increase. It was my hope these additional funds, however, would be better distributed among the Defense Department's needs, notably to ease barracks crowding and address the mold and rust and other challenging conditions that we sometimes see. However, it appears that the focus remains on weapon systems and readiness. I'm concerned about the Department's investment priorities for infrastructure, frankly. From 1990 to 2017, the percentage of Milcon family housing in the Department's ob obligational authority is only 1.2 percent to 4.5 percent. I'm troubled that the Department is neglecting this need. If we remove some specific initiatives like, over, like, like OCO construction, base realignment and closure rounds, and grow the force initiatives, the Milcon percentage of total Defense Department funding is likely much lower. While I believe that each of you has done a great job prioritizing your services needs with the resources you have and doing what's best for the warfighter with the funds you request, this lack of investment compounds over time, as I have said to some of you when uh, we met in my office. And it has real, often negative consequences for those who serve. For example, at Alaska's Joint Base Elmendorf Richardson, the Air Force was concerned that they would have to park their $100 million F-35 outside because the hangar was simply not sufficient. And I have been to other bases where outside parking of very expensive uh, aerial equipment is, uh, is a problem. So it's not just Hawa uh, Alaska that's a problem. In Hawaii at Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam, the Air National Guard parks the F-22, a fifth generation fighter that costs $339 million per airframe inside a clamshell hangar made of semi-permanent tensile fabric and aluminum. Given that I live in Hurricane Alley, I can assure you this is simply not optimal. In addition to the lack of investment in our facilities that we need to house our weapon systems, I believe we are failing to invest in our most important asset, the soldier, the Marine, or the airman or sailor who protects our nation. Service members and their family are regular, regularly voicing frustrations over poor barracks conditions. I've had those frustrations, frustrations expressed to me directly. The very places that we often ask our warfighters war to return home to after tours. These brave men and women simply deserve decent shelter, and I fear that we are not always providing that. I'm especially concerned that quality of life projects continue to be set aside as you all are forced to focus on other needs of the department. 
The Department of Defense leadership needs to do a better job of investing in critical infrastructures and request a realistic number for military construction to ensure we have 21st century facilities to go with our 21st century weapon systems. What happens is that MILCON gets the leftovers. I mean, that's basically what happens. All the other bu budget priorities are taken care of, and then whatever's left over is parked in MILCON. And I would bet if we had more extensive conversations privately, each of you would agree. Mr. Chairman, in addition to making sure that we have modern infrastructure, we need to make sure that the Department is able to get rid of the ins infrastructure that it no longer needs. The recent National Defense Strategy stated that the Department, quote, will also work to reduce excess property and infrastructure, providing Congress with options for a base realignment and closure. I was surprised to see that after six straight years of requesting a background, coupled with the National Defense Strategy, the Administration chose not to do so for FY 2019. While I understand that a BRAC would be difficult for members, we cannot keep maintaining infrastructure that we no longer need. I'm curious as to why we are taking a tool for saving money off the table. In addition to excess infrastructure, I have questions on why the Department plans to build another prison at Guantanamo Bay, a facility that we should be closing. A $69 million facility, a $69 million facility is a complete waste of valuable resources, and building a brand new facility for less than 50 people is a serious misallocation of resources, especially when you factor in that we will have to pay the sustainment costs for the next five years while the prison is built. There are fi far higher MILCON priorities for which we could use that funding, some of which I just described. As you can see, Mr. Chairman, we have some difficult issues to cover today, and I thank you for the opportunity to share my concerns. And if I could, Mr. Chairman, though, before we begin, I, I want to take a brief moment to acknowledge someone very special to me um, who has been a part of my team uh, on and off for uh, a, a very long while. And uh, my Deputy Chief of Staff, Rosalind Kumar, uh, will serve her last week with the United States House of Representatives next week, and this is her last hearing with us. So I just wanted to thank her for her service, and not only to our country, but to me and the constituents of Florida's 23rd Congressional District. <laughs> with that indulgence, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, and uh, uh, thank you uh, for those comments, uh, Representative Wasserman Schultz. Um, and Rosalind, thank you for your service. It's much appreciated, and we wish you all the best in your next chapter in life, whatever that may be, <laughs> and, uh, but thank you for your, your dedicated service uh, to this, uh, to the Congresswoman and to this institution. It's uh, deeply appreciated. We can't say thank you enough to a lot of the staff around here who, who really do a lot to help make us look very good uh, on a regular basis. <laughs> so uh, with that, um, I would like to now introduce our very distinguished panel of guests, uh, starting first with Mr. Uh, Lucian uh, Niemeyer, uh, Chad's Ford, Pennsylvania's finest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's that? Amen. Amen. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Energy Installations and Environment, uh, Office of Secretary of Defense. Uh, he's accompanied by Lieutenant General uh, Gwen Bingham, uh, Assistant uh, Chief of Staff for Installations Management, uh, U.S. Army. Thank you for being here, Vice Admiral uh, Dixon uh, Dixon Smith, uh, who is also here, Deputy Chief of Naval Operations, Fleet Readiness and Logistics, Navy. Uh, Major General Vincent uh, Colonies. Uh, almost Lansdale, Pennsylvania's finest, by the way, uh, Commander Re Marine Corps Installations Command and Assistant Deputy Commandant Installations and Logistics Facilities, and uh, Major, uh, Major General uh, Timothy Green, uh, Director of Civil Engineers and Deputy Chief of Staff uh, for Logistics, Engineering, Force Protection, and Air Force. Uh, I'm glad uh, that civil engineers get a shout out in, uh, in your title. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you for taking time to be here and uh, for sharing your perspectives and expertise. And without objection, uh, all written statements uh, will be entered in the official <laughs> record. Uh, due to the number of witnesses, uh, Mr. Niemeyer, please summarize your statement in about five minutes, if you would, so that uh, we can maximize the time for dialogue between the panel and the subcommittee uh, members. Uh, with that, uh, you recognize Mr. Niemeyer. Chairman Dent, uh, Ranking Member Washman Soltz, I really appreciate the opportunity here to t discuss with you the President's FY19 uh, installations and, uh, and environment programs. Um, we look forward to working with this committee uh, uh, to support the priorities of the department and the quality of life uh, for the military members and the family members who are called to sacrifice so much on behalf of our country. I have submitted my written statement for the record, and, and I'm honored to speak on behalf of my colleagues representing the services here this morning. I wish we had prizes for how long our titles are. Uh, it seems we get the longest in the Department of Defense, um, but I'm definitely uh, honored to speak on their behalf, and I'm sure you'll be able to uh, talk to them more uh, uh, during the question period. Uh, Chairman Dent also realized this may be my one and only time uh, speaking, uh, testifying before you. I 
want to personally thank you on behalf of the women in the military uh, for your uh, service to our country and, and, and Congress, and really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, we're grateful to Congress and the American people uh, for the recently enacted Bipartisan uh, Budget Act of 2018, which provided the resources to begin the recovery from the impacts of sequestration. We have a responsibility now to honor that trust, uh, the American people, by spending each defense dollar wisely to address the most urgent priorities to build a more lethal, resilient, and rapidly innovating joint force. Earlier this year, the President released a national security strategy which guided the development of a national defense strategy to clearly articulate the threats and the challenges our nation faces around the world. Our mission is clear. We must be prepared to defend the homeland, remain the preeminent, preeminent military power in the world, and advance international order that promotes security and prosperity. The strategy confronts the stark reality that the homeland is no longer a sanctuary. America is a target, whether from terrorists seeking to hurt our citizens, malicious cyber activity against personal, commercial, or government infrastructure, or political and information subversion. Attacks against our critical defense, government, and economic infrastructure must be anticipated and, more importantly, must be deterred. The strategy laid out by the Secretary of Defense also requires each of us in the Department to help drive budget discipline and affordability in order to direct resources to the highest warfighter requirements. In our resp responsibilities for those here at the table, uh, we strive for the effective use of installations and ranges. Our 2019 <laughs> budget prior uh, priorities enable the Department to establish a foundation for rebuilding the U.S. military into a more capable, lethal, and ready joint force. Each military services has distinct readiness recovery plans, and the increase, increases are targeted to advance these plans. <laughs> I know I speak for my colleagues to emphasize that readiness, modernization, and reform are our top three priorities for each service. Department of Defense supports these efforts. Continued congressional support for installations ensures that we sustain a total force that is lethal, efficient, and trained to counter all threats across, across 21st century multi-domain battle space. In supporting these priorities, DOD representatives before you today provide warfighter capabilities through over 585,000 installations, facilities, and for well, over more than 500 bases, with replacement costs exceeding $1 trillion. And that doesn't include the 27 million acres that we, that we train on. We also construct facilities to provide our combatant commanders overseas in partnership with our allies, the basic capability and adaptability needed um, for worldwide flexibility. The continued support of Congress, and in particularly the hard work of this subcommittee, enables us to enhance the agility, resiliency, and readiness and lethality of our forces around the world. With a clear understanding of the roles of this team at this table supporting that strategy, we have set forth the following objectives to confront the challenges posed by years of underfunded facility accounts and, and as well as our infrastructure accounts. Number one, we're using every program and funding source available to us to eliminate waste in DOD installations and infrastructure. Number two, we continue to advocate for adequate funding for the installation and infrastructure accounts to meet mission requirements and to address risks to safety and readiness. Number three, we're working to protect installations and ranges from incompatible development and to enhance the combat credibility of our nation's test and training regions. And that's an important point. How do we actually start stimulating more what we may face around the world and the ability to resource that to be able to fight our warfighters in adequate training and test environment? We are implementing programs to enhance the energy security of our forces and assets. This is one of our highest priorities here, and we ask for the support of the committee. What more can we do to make ourselves more resilient, more secure from those who want to attack our electrical grid and, and or attack or exploit our, our facility-related control, control systems where we really need this continued support of this committee in those particular priorities? We're exploring new opportunities, number five, for third-party partnerships engaging with industries to determine the best practices for our current challenges. Number six, we're working with the military engineering contracting community to develop smarter contracts and to execute our contracts more smartly. We continue to provide for the safety and welfare of our people and our resources through unparalleled environmental stewardship and occupational safe program, safety programs. And last, but definitely not least, we are enhancing our collaboration with the hundreds of defense communities that you represent and we represent around the nation, supporting our bases and providing for the quality of life for our troops and their families. These guiding principles will allow us to apply the resources requested in the FY19 budget to achieve real results. We've requested $10.5 billion for military construction and family housing appropriations, an increase of about $700 million from the FY18 base budget. 
While this request before you makes significant progress in recapitalizing facilities in poor and failing condition, this year's funding will not fully restore the damage caused by years of sequestration. Many of our facilities have degraded significantly from reduced investments in all accounts. As the ranking member pointed out, the department currently has an unfunded backlog of uh, exceeding 116 billion. A lot of our facilities are in either failed or poor condition. This will ultimately uh, result in DOD facing larger bills in the future to go ahead and restore or replace facilities that de de deteriorate prematurely. The stark reality is that it, is too, it may be too costly to buy ourselves out of this backlog. The department must ensure that its infrastructure is ideally sized to increase the lethality of U.S. forces while minimizing the cost of maintaining unneeded capacity, which otherwise diverts resources from critical readiness and modernization requirements. As noted in the National Defense Strategy, we continue to work to reduce excess capacity and infrastructure, and will work with Congress on options for base realignments and closures. We realize that we've asked for six years, and for six years, Congress has said no. We can't keep doing that. We have to work with you on a common way forward that will allow us to, to, to make prudent reductions in our infrastructure. We must ensure that our basic infrastructure is ideally sized to increase the lethality of our forces while minimizing the cost of maintaining unneeded capacity. These efforts will be enhanced by a careful evaluation we're currently conducting of how and where we base new forces, new technologies, new capabilities in support of the National Defense Strategy. Where and how we base new hypersonic systems, autonomous vehicles, cyber forces will have an impact on their lethality. We need to assess the ideal methods for the training and deployment of directed energy programs, electronic warfare, and artificial intelligence programs. All these concepts which are called for and this country desperately needs, needs to have a basic infrastructure that will allow us to, be, to deploy, train them effectively. In lieu of another BRAC request, in 19 to authorize initial background. We are reviewing our facilities to include facility usage optimization. Are we actually ideally sized and are we putting the right number of people in our buildings uh, to ensure we have a better accounting of excess infrastructure? Our efforts will allow us to work with Congress further on fair, objective, and transparent options for future base realignments and closures. Absent a new request and a new background, DOD has also largely been focused on routine demolition and renovation of buildings as part of our MILCOM program. The Department has dedicated additional resources in FY19 uh, to demolish more unneeded facilities, including $442 million specifically for demolition and another $65 million as part of our MILCOM program. This is one step we can take now to go ahead and meet that goal. In order to deliver maximum results for our MILCOM program, we are targeting funding in the key areas. And I'll go through that. Actually, I've submitted those for the record, and I'll go ahead and, uh, and, and, and point those out that they are stated for the record. One program that's absolutely essential to us, Mr. Chairman, is the EarthSIP program. That is the Energy Resiliency Conservation Improvement Program. We're using that $150 million, and we hope at some point we'll be able to raise that, uh, to uh, allow us to address those critical resiliency projects that are absolutely important for us for energy security. For many years, we've been doing energy projects that don't necessarily feed those critical missions. We're trying to get that changed right now, put investments so all those projects we worked on in the last few years, we can now power critical facilities. The department's also committed to protecting the quality of life for, for military personnel and their families by ex ensuring access, access to suitable, affordable housing and unaccompanied barracks. The environment and quality of life which our forces and their families experience has an impact on their ability to do their job and the ability of our departments to recruit and retain. We do have a significant unaccompanied barracks re re recapitalization program well over a billion dollars, and we look forward to help us re renovate or, or upgrade over almost 2,000 new home, uh, uh, beds. And we, we're, we're very proud of the fact that we continue to invest in those types of quality of life projects. We do have challenges we're facing. We have an unstable bid climate, uh, particularly as a result of the storms that have affected the southern part of the United States and Puerto Rico. That's driving uncertainty in our military construction programs, for which we are asking for to have the flexibility to be able to apply bid savings, continue to apply bid savings for those projects that we desperately need, that are high priorities, um, that we need to continue, even though we might have a higher bid than usual due to what's happening with our labor markets. We'd ask for support in helping us maintain those, un uh, those uh, un unobligated balances. We also have challenges with project delivery. This committee and the appropriations committees last year talked, uh, had some serious discussions, and we've 
taken on some serious efforts with the Corps of Engineers and, and Naval Facilities Command on trying to get better at project delivery. So many, too many of our projects are coming in behind schedule or over budget. We're working very diligently, diligently with our construction management partners to try to rein that in. Restoring the military readiness requires us we maintain access to training lands and to protect for the protection of our health of our force. The department's environmental budget accomplishes these objectives through activities ranging from managing critical, critical habitats to avoiding training restrictions to addressing drinking water health advisories and making the best use of limited cleanup dollars. Our warfighters also need unencumbered access to Mr. land, Secretary, water, and airspace Mr. to Secretary, home may I ask that you wrap up your remarks quickly? Because I'd like to let the other panelists make some brief remarks. I want to keep as many members as sure I can thing. here for questions. I'll go ahead and uh, just point out the fact that we are also working on land management issues. And I'll go ahead and just uh, fi finalize the comments with sense of saying thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member. And thank you for the members of the panel for your support for our priorities and, uh, and, and continued support for the win and amendment of the military. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I'd like to see if uh, any of the other panelists would like to make any opening remarks to the record. If not, then I'll go right to the questions. We'll start right in. And um, first, uh, uh, Mr. Niemeyer, I'd like to talk uh, about the, uh, the so-called border wall. Um, ultimately, the, uh, border, the, the border wall would be a, a, a function of the Department of Homeland Security, uh, it'd be under their bill if it were ever to be funded. Uh, what part of the wall would be at, uh, at the cost to DOD, and specifically for military construction? Uh, and what authorities uh, currently exist uh, to enable uh, MILCON dollars to be used to pay for the, the so-called wall? Are there any new authorities uh, that would be required? So we're in the preliminary stages of responding to the President's uh, desire to want to do more on the border. As you know, we've already uh, uh, deployed forces there, consistent with what we've, has been done in the past. And as far as additional investments for the wall itself, we're exploring options about what potentially could be done. We're very much at the preliminary stages of that. Um, there are authorities that do exist in law, um, but we understand that, uh, that the Congress provided those authorities for very specific instances. Um, and we are looking to see to what extent they, they could be used, to what extent they are appropriate. More importantly, our continued desire to want to continue to work with the committees to making sure that we are working with you to, uh, on the use of those authorities. And what do you think the uh, uh, the cost of DOD would be in terms of MILCON? You haven't uh, we, you know, we, determined that? First of all, we've determined that uh, we, we'd be looking at a relatively small portion of the overall 1,900-mile construction. We're really looking at a, uh, the portion that r r runs adjacent or uh, along the Barry Goldwater military range. So we're talking total of about 37 miles. We don't have a firm estimate because there's a range of options about what we would be asked to do there. So we're still exploring that to what degree we can do that and what ultimately what it would cost. So I don't have any firm estimates for you, for you at this time. Okay, is it, is it correct too that DOD can only build on DOD property? That's the current understanding, sir. Okay, and, um, and you said the approximate number of miles is about 37 on the Gold, Goldwater Range. Um, that's about the... Uh, the extent of it then? That's what we're looking at right now, and, and, and part of it already has a, a barrier. So, um, so, so, so the whole 2,000-mile border yeah, under right. Milcon maximum, you, you would estimate would be 37 miles? We have not been asked to take a look at the entire, the entire portion for use of DOD dollars. Okay. And, um, all right. That's, uh, okay. That, thanks for that answer. I, I appreciate that. Uh, I'd like to also now move to... Uh, Another issue for you, Mr. Niemeyer. Uh, in fiscal year 2018 uh, House report uh, for the committee, uh, we directed the Defense Health Agency to report to Congress on specific changes in, in Germany uh, in Germany energy law that, relayed the, uh, that delayed the uh, Rhine Ordnance Barracks Medical Center's replacement life cycle cost analysis. That's a mouthful. And uh, what effect the changes have on current facilities and construction in the region. Uh, could you provide us an update on the energy study? Uh, and what effects, if any, uh, the changes would have on the replacement project? So I can give you some overall response to that legislation. I think the Army can give you specifics about what we're looking at uh, for that particular area. Uh, we definitely understand the intent of Congress. Um, there is a concern that uh, using uh, sources that would be dependent on Russia is probably not in our best interest right now because it's subject to potentially having been disrupted. So we are looking at a dedicated preferred domestic source of fuel that will allow us to have the flexibility and the freedom uh, without necessarily relying on, on, on foreign uh, energy sources. And I'll, 
I'm not sure, uh, General Bing, if you've got no. anything to add to that. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman. I uh, really can't talk to the specifics of the uh, source for that particular hospital, but I can tell you that uh, that uh, decision-making process is in progress, and uh, we will look at the reliability of those energy sources. Uh, what I can tell you as it relates to in the broader scheme of energy security and resilience, last year our acting secretary signed out a directive whereby all our installations would get after uh, being able to provide for energy and water security for a period of 14 days. We are taking uh, our threats very seriously to that end and uh, going about it that way. Thank you for that answer. And then my final uh, question before I yield to the uh, uh, ranking member. Um, as a result of the, uh, uh, the budget deal for fiscal years uh, 18 and 19, there's, there's an increase in Department of Defense funding, as you all know. Uh, I supported that budget agreement and uh, I want the department to spend the money wisely. I, I do not support any intention or idea to alter this agreement uh, at this time. Uh, could you provide some insight to the committee on how the department plans on spending the increase uh, in military construction dollars? For I mean, F for 19. For 19. Yes. Um, mainly looking at our uh, national defense strategy and seeing where we uh, have additional requirements that could be funded. Um, it runs the gamut uh, from operational facilities. We're, we were looking at some additional uh, projects overseas for 19 that we added to our budget. Um, but as far as uh, a significant, significant costs, about a 700 million total um, that, were, that we uh, were able to add to um, our overall request. You know, at this time, I recognize the ranking member for her questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Secretary, I uh, mentioned in my opening re re remarks my concern about um, the administration's proposed FY1969 million dollar expenditure for a high value detention facility at Gitmo. Um, that facility would be built for 41 people at best, possibly due to transfers that potential transfers that have been reported in the press, uh, that number could drop. But even with the 41 detainees, um, it would cost $1.7 million per detainee for this facility. It's a facility that wouldn't even be finished until 2022. Um, given that in my opening remarks and in our conversation in my office, uh, we've both acknowledged that there are very high priorities many of which the chairman and I have seen, whether it's in Puerto Rico, in Florida, um, across the country, across the world, in Milcon, that, uh, that I would say are a much higher priority in terms of their deterioration than the plight of providing a better facility for a maximum of 41 uh, detainees in Gitmo, a facility that should be closed. Um, can you uh, explain why we need a facility for 41 people and spent to spend $1.7 million yes, per detainee rather than making sure that we can take care of our service personnel who certainly could benefit much more from those, from those funds? Yes, ma'am. I mean, this is a tough situation. Um, our policy in the Guantanamo Bay has been, been contentious for many years. I, I know uh, there are still bad guys out there that, that, that uh, want to kill people that we need to have been determined by this administration we need to go ahead and detain, continue to detain at Guantanamo Bay. Um, the, it is, uh, that particular facility is a replacement facility. It's, uh, so we're, we realize we have some pretty poor and continuing to deteriorate existing facilities. Uh, and for years, uh, while we were looking at the policy to close Gitmo, we didn't really reinvest in that facility. So it's in pretty bad shape right now. And we do have a responsibility, if we're going to maintain a, a function down there, that we do ought, need to offer adequate facilities for the care of the detainees we do have. The cost is, ex uh, is, is Secretary, very expensive. Forgive me, but why would it be a higher priority to provide more comfortable facilities for these 41 people and not build more barracks so that we have more comfortable facilities for our soldiers, airmen, seamen, and... Uh, Marines. Yeah, I'm not sure we're, we're, we are actually creating a better quality of life for them. I think there's a realization. If you a brand new facility, that's a better quality of life than we, a deteriorating we, facility. We've had eight now. years where we've had no investments in there because we felt that we had a policy where we were trying to close our detention operations there. Right. So there's been no investments. So all we're really trying to do is, okay, now we've made the decision, okay, uh, guess what? What I'm asking you is why is it a higher priority yeah. to build a facility that would provide 
you know, better conditions for 41 so-called bad dudes, that, uh, that the pre as the President refers to them, than for the good dudes that are serving our country and trying to keep us safe. I think we have a responsibility that anybody is under our care, whether it be Why bad or good. Why do we have a good? higher responsibility to the bad dudes at Gitmo than we do to our military service members who are protecting our country. We balance the full range of our missions in the Department of Defense to include maintaining detention operations. And so we have priorities for our women and women in the military, but we also have a responsibility that if we're going to maintain our operation there, that we at least we address the life safety health concerns that might be um, getting worse for that particular facility. The President made a campaign pledge. That, that's not really an answer. And if your answer is that we should put the needs and well-being of 41 detainees at Gitmo um, higher than the, uh, than, than the people who serve our country, then that is really demonstrative of this administration's backwards priorities. Um, but the President has also made a campaign pledge to load up Gitmo with some bad dudes. Are there plans to ramp up operations at Gitmo? Uh, that I don't know. I mean, it's really difficult to anticipate who you might be catching in the future. Uh, and it's beyond my uh, understanding. I just know that we were given a military construction requirement to replace the deteriorating it's not facility. Difficult. I mean, while we're searching, are, are we planning on, as we search and hunt down bad dudes, are we planning to use Gitmo and ramp up operations there to add to the detainees that are uh, there now? I, I, I'm not at a point right now where I can answer that. I just know we have a military construction Why? request because because it's tough to anticipate what we think we may need in the future. Well, you're who, building who, a brand new facility for 41 people, so at best. So to me, that signal, which won't even be ready till 2022, to me that signals that you are ramping up operations there, unless you are just being colossally fiscally irresponsible, and think it's okay to spend 1.7 million dollars per detainee. From our perspective, it, 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 it signals that we realize that we're going to have a long-term operation there, that we need to then make so sure that they're adequately yes. housed. I'm sorry. Your answer is yes. About then. what? About ramping up operations. I, 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 no, I don't know if we're going to ramp up operations. I don't know who we might what end up having in the future. What does long-term mean? Long term is as long as those folks, we can either uh, adjudicate their process or in some cases now they've been convicted and, and for the long term it's, an, it's a, it's some a of them haven't even been detention charged. facility. That's correct. That's, we're in the process of working on How will this facility be used after the JTF mission ends? Uh, don't know what the follow-on mission would be. I mean, it's tough for, for me to make that call right now. Uh, we do know that, they, uh, that we are taking a prudent step. I mean, uh, with the area cost factor in Guam, I'm sorry, in uh, Gitmo being so high, it's an expensive facility. Uh, the reason why it's going to take till 2022 is if we wanted to accelerate, it would cost us more. So we've made some prudent decisions on trying to minimize the cost of the taxpayer Just while providing for the, uh, addressing the lastly, health concerns. since you touched on that, mm -hmm. um, before I yield back, Mr. Chairman, thank you for your indulgence. Um, obviously, you're going to have to use operation and maintenance money to sustain the facility. What are the current sustainment costs and how much has been invested in the facility since it started to fail? Uh, the existing facilities? I'd have to get that for the record. I don't have that with me. Okay. If you could do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I yield back. I'd like to recognize the gentleman from uh, West Virginia for five thank minutes, Mr. Jenkins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome. It's uh, an honor to have you all here, and thank you for all you do for our men and women in uniform. Thank you for your service. I'm from, as the chairman said, West Virginia, and uh, candidly, we've been ravaged over the last eight years, uh, the war on coal. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, hardworking coal miners put out of work. These are people who have gone into the bowels of the earth, done tough jobs, work with their hands, are problem solvers. But we've also got a lot of land in West Virginia. In fact, there's a piece of property uh, originally called Hobet, Hobet Mine, but it's Rock Creek now, 12,000 acres, less than a drive's day from over one half of the nation's population. And I was struck by your use of the word simulating. And in your also written comments about uh, readiness and prepare for the, uh, the battles that we fight around the world, we've got steep hills, we've got flat land, we've got almost like desert terrain. So my question is, our National Guard in West Virginia, which we are so proud of, is already using, they're saving money uh, on transportation, uh, on other uh, training uh, cost uh, uh, factors. Where is this 12,000 acres on your radar sc uh, screen as a possibility for investment 
uh, and DOD uh, to simulate, to train, to repair equipment. Uh, it's geographically pretty darn good, and uh, uh, it's a pretty special area that could be put to good use. So, Congressman, the, the military services take the lead, um, and, and they are in the process right now of looking at what they need for additional training lands and a whole different variation of topographies around the country. Uh, the Navy's working on a significant land expansion uh, for NAS Fallon. Uh, to what degree we could use the terrain that's unique? I've actually been out that area. Uh, I, it's something that I'd want to work with the National Guard on, work with the Department of the Army, and see, okay, how does that fit into an overall training regimen, particularly when General Milley is looking for um, variations, new ways to train uh, his, his forces? So that's something we'll take a look at. I, I don't have specifics on it right now. I'm not sure if the Army does, but uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, Congressman Jenkins. I appreciate your question because I often find myself as a former senior commander saying that it, there's absolutely nothing we do inside our gates without the full support and partnership of our community leader and state leaders outside our gates. And so what uh, we could do is link your team up with our Army G3 to assess what you're proposing and get back to you on that. Well, we would welcome that, and you've got a very uh, ready and willing partner inside the gate and outside the gate. As an outside the gate guy who's a proud father of a son who's inside the gate, uh, we, uh, uh, you really would have incredible support from community, uh, from state and local government, and certainly the federal representatives. And my sense is you might find outside the gate in some states not as welcoming as you would be. We're a proud military state, probably from a per capita standpoint, uh, uh, one of the highest military service uh, member state uh, in the country. Uh, the other area of uh, uh, quick attention, and thank you for your commitment to work with our office and others to see if we can't put this uh, uh, land to good use. And that's our readiness centers in West Virginia. We have 31 readiness centers. Uh, I, I certainly obviously don't uh, expect to hear at this point the commitment uh, or the f deep familiarity with those particular facilities, but we really would like to work with you about uh, our readiness centers in West Virginia. We've got uh, 5,000 National Guards men and women and 31 readiness centers, so there's a real uh, facility needs in our state, and we look forward to working with you and your budget line items. Any comments about readiness centers and the investment uh, to making sure that those are uh, up to the standards that we would expect? Thank you again, Congressman. Uh, actually, the uh, National Guard has a transformation plan uh, that really is the blueprint, if you will, for what we look at as we look to investment. And so our investments in those readiness centers is informed by that uh, plan. We know that the Guard has well over 1,000 readiness centers, and so we, and when we look at sustainment dollars, restoration modernization dollars, and MILCON dollars, we certainly want to get after those that uh, bring about uh, readiness for your Guardsmen. Uh, currently, uh, our Guard requests in FY19, there are five projects that total $106 million. Thank, Thank you. you for your question. Thank you so much. Look forward to working with you about Rock Creek, Hobet, our readiness centers, and thank you again for your service. I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jenkins. It sounded like to recognize a gentlelady from California, Ms. Lee, for five thank minutes. Thank you very much. Oh. Welcome. Uh, thank you for your service. Uh, and just know, if you don't know, I'm the daughter of um, a veteran, 25 years, uh, military brat, uh, stationed at um, Fort Bliss, Texas born in El Paso. And so quality of life issues for our troops and our veterans are extremely important to me. I know personally um, the sacrifices that um, are made by our servicemen and women and want to see um, and want to make sure everything that we do uh, ensures uh, their safety, but also that they're able to um, live uh, healthy lives and uh, continue forward with their service. I wanted to ask you a couple of uh, questions with regard to um, specifically um, my district uh, in the East Bay, including Alameda Point. I think, uh, Vice Admiral Smith, maybe uh, you could answer this question um, for me. Uh, the city of Alameda 
uh, took title to about 1,400 acres of land from the Navy in 2000, I believe it was 2013, and the VA took about 624 acres. It's cost about $560 million now to, um, as it relates to environmental cleanup. Still not completed, but I think the repurposing of uh, Alameda Point with this VA clinic, it's a good example of what can be done. The environmental re remediation efforts are still continuing, and I wondered when you think that may be completed and what uh, the next steps would be in terms of long-term environmental uh, sustainability and the overall stewardship efforts yes, of that. folks to figure out what's the right way ahead on that. Based upon that, now we're looking at finishing transferring probably around 2022, ma'am, right now. 2022. Yes, ma'am. Why is that taking, why is it taking so long? Well, for, because we've, you know, we want to make sure that we're turning over land that has been properly decontaminated and we don't run into the problem that we did with the land we've already transferred there that we now have that yeah. problem with. So we, we've got to do it right. We're not sure how to remediate it yet, so we've got to work through with the regu regulatory agencies to make sure we do it the right way. Um, and as you know, with PFOS, PFOA, uh, we as a country have not figured out the right way to deal with that yet, so we're working through it. Okay, and, and let me just ask you, I want to clarify for myself, this is not going to impact the construction and the work with regard to the VA clinic in terms of your time frame of the environmental uh, I'm going to have to take that for the record. I don't have that uh -huh. specific detail. I, I don't know if it's that same area or not. I'll, yeah, I'll so double check. Okay. I owe that to you. Okay. On, um, with regard to the Oakland Army base, I guess Lieutenant General Bingham, mm -hmm. good to see you. Good to see you yeah. too, Congressman. Lieutenant General. Thank That's you. That's awesome. <laughs> Very humbling. That's awesome. Very humbling. <laughs> Hopefully general someday. Huh? Wow. <laughs> the Oakland um, Army Base remediation, uh, what are any of the current issues that you see? Uh, I know there have been some difficulties in terms of this remediation effort. Uh, not sure exactly what they are, but we're trying to get this done as quickly as possible. Uh, and again, we've got a lot of um, work to do on that Army base, and I want to see if there are any outstanding issues that I need to know about or that our base, our, our people in the city need to know about. Thank you, Congresswoman Lee. We are working through uh, two remediation projects there in Oakland Army base. Uh, at this time, um, we are uh, pretty much going through the scheduling, of the schedule, I should say, as it relates to the cleanup effort. I don't see any problems at this time, uh, certainly not to uh, involve you, and I think those efforts are ongoing. Uh, but the, if there should be a problem with that, we'll come back to your office and let you know. But at this time, we don't foresee any problems, although we have those two remediation efforts ongoing. Do you have any idea of when they will be complete? I, I don't know. Uh, I can come back to your staff. Yeah, I'd like to get a of sense that. of I'll be happy to come back to your staff. Date. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And then, uh, Assistant Secretary Niemeyer. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, good to meet you. Uh, Fort Bliss, Texas, and I'm working with Congressman O'Rourke, who represents uh, El Paso and Fort Bliss on these issues. And again, as I said, I was born in El Paso, and I have a very keen interest in what's taking place at Fort Bliss. And uh, Congressman O'Rourke and myself, uh, we're aware of the um, significant uh, delays as it relates to uh, the contractor uh, who is uh, building the construction delays for the new uh, Beaumont Hospital. And I'm wondering, uh, just in general, seeing what has taken place in terms of the history of this construction of, of Beaumont, uh, how are you looking at cost overruns now, and how do we manage this moving forward? Because it's severely over budget, this one project, I know, because I've looked at it with Congressman O'Rourke, and how do we correct for that in the future? Ma'am, that's an outstanding question, and 
outstanding question. We've been spending a lot of time on that in the last eight months since I took this position. I've been meeting with General Semini personally on that. Um, this is a project that not only is behind schedule, it's significantly over cost. I mean, it really is a, a poster child for us and what we need to do better in the future. Um, there were some management changes on the part of the, both the Corps of Engineers and the contractor. So really what we had was some bad relationships going. There's no way a personal relationship to interfere a project like that. So we've made some changes. But more importantly, looking forward, we're using that as an example of where we can get better across the board, across the Department of Defense. In the same time, we're also trying to work very uh, you know, diligently, uh, meeting once a, every two weeks right now at senior leadership levels to make sure that project gets back on track. We deliver that critical capability to, to women and men of Fort Bliss. It has been a, a tragic series of errors that has led to that uh, almost a year and a half uh, delay. Mr. Chairman, let me just ask you though, uh, are there ever any penalties associated with these uh, huge cost overruns with contractors that mess up big time like like they have at Fort Bliss? Or do we just say, uh, moving forward now, that was then and this is now and we're gonna make sure it's done correctly in the future? So Congress uh, asked us to actually get the Inspector General involved. So we have a DOD IG investigation going on on a particular project to determine if there's any culpability or any concerns that we need to take a look at. Um, there are damages that are applied to when the contract is running late, normally by the, uh, they're called liquidated damages uh, to the contractor. It may not be enough to change behavior right now, and I'm not sure the construction contractor is, is solely the problem. I think we had a problem with the design and some other issues too with program yeah. management. So the goal for us, ma'am, is, is to get to the bottom of this, to making sure we understand clearly what went wrong when. If we need to hold people accountable, we will. Uh, and, but more importantly is to use this as, uh, first of all, get this project back on track, but not to make these mistakes again in the future. Okay, thank you very much. Could you just keep Congressman O'Rourke and myself Absolutely, informed of this? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let's uh, move to uh, uh, Mr. D Mr. Uh, Taylor from Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, appreciate you guys being here. Appreciate your service, and please give our best to the men and women who serve under you uh, as well, and, and we appreciate them. A uh, couple things. Let's see. Bids. You know, you, you talked about bid costs, and obviously there's a plus up, and, and we have uh, a timing issue, of course. Um, are you guys using things like OTAs and SBIRs for contract vehicles to make sure that, that we're being able to spend the money and do it efficiently and effectively? So we've been given a lot of money in a short amount of time, particularly in the O&M accounts. And I think that's something that all the services and, and the execution agents are taking seriously. We have about five months um, to address some of the readiness needs in our country. We're pursuing any possible opportunity to include expedited contracting while still being able to provide um, a good product that addresses our warfighter needs. It's going to be a challenge, but uh, the services are dedicated um, to coming up with um, the, the best projects and the best way to spend the money between now and October 31st, particularly O and M. Are they or, using uh, those October 1st? Are those contract vehicles like OTAs and SBIRs? Uh, that and others. I mean, we, we have a whole range of, of, of abilities uh, to be able to put uh, money towards good projects. Appreciate it. Um, uh, you, you mentioned you, you spoke about six years asking for realignment and Congress saying, no, I agree. I just want to be on the record that I agree with that statement. I think that we need to make some courageous decisions up here. Um, otherwise, we're, we're contributing to the problem, if you will. Um, Virginia Beach and the state of Virginia have been very good about um, spending monies, if you will, dealing with encroachment on things like Oceana and trying to work with resiliency. And on the, on the subject of resiliency, of course, we have sea level rise uh, in Virginia that does affect our, our bases. Um, have there been studies, actions, requests for, for money to ensure resiliency around those bases? Yeah. That's the key step here is right now is we're taking a look at uh, what needs to be done, what has been done. Um, we've always responded uh, to flood conditions as part of what we've done as military engineers, um, why we look at preserving our military communities across the country. Uh, we'll continue to do that uh, in the Hampton Roads area in Virginia Beach where we can make good decisions about how high we, we raise a, a dry dock or how high we raise a dam. Those are all engineering decisions that we make every day and we'll continue to make those as we see uh, you know, conditions change around the country. If, if I may, and specifically in the Hampton Roads area with, with sea level rise, not being reactionary, but are we also looking at potentially investing in the future and understanding where we're gonna be uh, years out? So we are looking at uh, adjustments to what our engineering forecasts are and to what degree we can start planning now and just making prudent engineering decisions across the board and uh, be able to make ourselves, our facilities resilient to whatever may happen. You know, it could be, you know, it could be a lot of things that, that ultimately could affect environmental condition and affect our facilities. The goal is resiliency across the board. Do you want to add? I'd like to add. 
uh, for Langley Air Force Base, which is in that same region, we've already raised the elevations of our new construction. We've already moved uh, mechanical rooms and, and things like that from basements mm -hmm. up to higher ele elevations. So part of it is just, as you said, prudent planning. And I think that's being done both on the Navy side, but certainly on the Air Force side. We are already altering how we do the engineering work to protect our facilities and our, and our missions. Appreciate that. Um, you know, we were talking about realignment and talking about getting monies for, for demo and in general, we spoke about it as well. Uh, and I've had meetings with senior military leaders and installation commanders talking about excess infrastructure and the cost. And, and I, like I could just set them on the record about that Congress has to also make some tough decisions uh, on that note. But can I just get a quick briefing from the from each of the service? Um, we had, we talked to the services and OSD and requested you know where they are. Can you just speak at your current posture as it pertains to excess infrastructure and any plans for targeted demolition going forward? Thank you, Congressman. I appreciate the question. Actually, we've looked at our excess infrastructure. We know we have about 170 million square feet of excess uh, cap uh, capacity. It's not all contiguous space. So what we did in the Army, we took on an initiative we call the Reduce the Footprint, which uh, we were able to consolidate our soldiers into our best facilities first, uh, use conversion authority, and then demo those uh, facilities that were in poor and fell in condition that we know we wouldn't use again. Uh, we've really taken on our demolition budget uh, since 2016. We've increased it significantly. And I can tell you in 2018, we have about $100 million that's going toward demolition. In FY19, we more than double that, well over 200 million. So we are taking it seriously, and we are trying to rid ourselves of that excess because we know it's cost in dollars. Thank you. Uh, Congressman, so for the Navy, the, uh, we estimate we have between seven and nine percent excess um, infrastructure right now. Um, this year, uh, with, with uh, the increased uh, budget proposal uh, for the first for the first time uh, in several years, we're putting a significant amount of money to demo, uh, tune of $122 million. Uh, we've currently got um, an integrated priority list of about $311 million, so about a little over a third we're going after in 19. Uh, that compares to $0 to demo last year, um, $8 million the year before. So um, much like the Army, I'm sure all the services, we're going after it, and this year's proposed budget just gives us that opportunity to do it. Yeah. Congressman, th thanks for the question. Uh, we talked a little bit about this yesterday. Uh, an infrastructure reset program that was signed by the Commandant. It's really a comprehensive program, and demolition's a big part of it. We're looking to reduce our over to fit up 11 million square feet. We're investing in in, this, in, uh, in PB18 or PB19 is 1.8 uh, million square feet, about 74 million dollars. And what does that give us? Uh, in, in the strategy itself, we want to reduce and optimize the infrastructure footprint. Uh, make facilities investment the lowest life cycle costs and leverage the best practices and processes in line installation management enterprise or governance. So we signed recently the app, assistant commandant of Marine Corps signed a, a governance. And the 1.8 million square feet, what does that equate to? It's really great return on investment because it's about nine, it's about nine point four million dollars of cost avoidance or ability to invest in another program. And, and so like I said, 74 million for PB19, pretty much 66 million across the fit-up is a big part of it, to reduce 11 million just for this fit-up and then another 22 million. So uh, we're going after it. The low-hanging fruit's easy right now. I mean, the demolition to go after it. And then as, as we get rid of that excess and we kind of consolidate our, our forces and, and better use of space management of our facilities, uh, it'll be harder to get after that next uh, round. But uh, thank you for the question. I think, it's re I think it's a really important part of our strategy. Thank you, sir. Um, so like the others, we're working on space management and how we u utilize that. Uh, we don't have so many units that have stood down, and so we don't have vacant buildings per se, so it's about how we use the space within that. And then as you hear the Air Force talk about excess capacity, much of that is also associated with ramp space, where we have the ability to, to park aircraft. And so as long as we've got missions there, it's about how we need to better leverage our facility space and consolidations, and you've given us some new authorities from Congress to do that better in the future. And then we spend roughly, we budget roughly about $25 million a year, give or take, but we're usually executing, over-executing that amount to do consolidation and demolition. Thank you, General. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Go Navy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you.
guests for, uh, for your time today and for your service to our nation. Uh, my questions are mostly uh, aimed at uh, Vice Admiral uh, Smith, but uh, if the Assistant Secretary wants to touch in, please do. The Navy's installation master plan for 2030 uh, for Naval Air Station Lemoore highlights that a large portion of the NAS Lemoore's facilities and infrastructural are original to the base, which was commissioned in 1961. The master plan lists a series of prioritized military construction projects needed to support the Navy's vision for NAS Lemoore as the premier strike fighter master jet base. However, uh, the master plan separates master plan priority projects and those needed to support the arrival of the F-35C. Given the high importance of both new mission military construction and the maintenance of existing facilities, how does the Navy plan to prioritize investments to support current missions and plan growth in personnel and families? And I would like something touched upon, on, uh, especially with the hospital clinic and how it, uh, our uh, sailors have access to and their families' health care there on the base. Yes, sir, Congressman, thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you for that. So <clears throat> as you're aware, uh, between uh, fiscal year 15 uh, to 23, we're putting in over half a billion dollars uh, into Lemoore. Uh, the the preponderance of that is for F-35. Uh, with respect to other parts, especially on the other side of the base, uh, on the quality of life side, uh, we've put a lot into the quality of life uh, part of that, uh, and whether it be renovating the gym, putting the tracks, the things that, that you have seen. Uh, so it, it is a balanced approach. Yes, the preponderance is to support F-35 and the, and the requirements that that um, aircraft has. Um, with respect to the, um, the clinic, uh, the branch medical clinic uh, there, so after our discussion yesterday, I went and, and pulled some more data on that. Uh, so um, uh, OB deliveries uh, are done at a local uh, clinic by uh, Navy phys physicians. Uh, based upon uh, some of the concerns the race raised that you articulated yesterday, uh, the acute care clinic hours have expanded, so they now run from 7 o'clock in the morning till uh, 11 o'clock at night. Uh, for inpatient, uh, they are using Hanford uh, Hospital. So um, talked to the Surgeon General's office yesterday uh, to, to relay uh, the concerns that you're, you're uh, hearing from uh, our sailors that are out there to make sure he's under, he understands that and we're aware of that to continue to work for and address those uh, concerns as we, best we can, sir. All right. Well, that, and the clinic used to be a hospital there on the base was uh, something that I've heard from a lot of sailors every time I go out anywhere around the world and visit with our sailors or even there on the base, that's the first thing they mention is they always appreciate having that hospital knowing that their family had somewhere close to home in case of an emergency for their, for their loved ones. Um, the other question has a little bit to do with the drought. Uh, California has been experiencing historic uh, drought conditions. I mean, it, it got a little bit better last year, but this past, uh, this past year we're, we're kind of on path again. And as you know, such conditions uh, change the operating environment at Naval Air Station Lemoore during dry periods, dust, uh, ground debris, and increased bird strikes uh, exasperate uh, operational safety challenges for fly, uh, flight operations. Additionally, drought conditions increase public health concerns for military personnel and dependents, specifically at NAS Lemoore, where valley fever poses a threat. What is the current status of uh, drought preparedness and resilience in NAS Lemoore, and are there any additional actions that could be taken to improve operations out there? Uh, yes, sir. So, the, um, as you know, there's 12,000 uh, acres out there uh, that are, is ag land, uh, and to be able to farm that land, uh, water is essential. And so Lemoore is working closely uh, with the water district out there, uh, as you're well aware. This also kind of ties into what we're doing to the question uh, we discussed yesterday with respect to the solar uh, PV that's going out there. Um, so that solar PV, uh, we're providing 930 acres for that. Uh, that will not provide any power to Lemoore. That will go into the local grid. The delay right now is because they're trying to find a utility provider who will actually connect to the grid. So the in-kind we will get back from that um, is a 4.5 megawatt uh, generator to provide uh, the critical, uh, to power the critical facilities in case of a, a loss. So um, it, it's a win-win for us because it does give us additional redundancy and capability from an energy needs perspective, but it also takes of that uh, 12,000 acres, it's taking almost 1,000 out of the ag, um, agricultural requirement uh, with the drainage settlement agreement um, and then the um, 
company that runs the PV farm is responsible for maintaining uh, BASH requirements there. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Fortenberry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for appearing before us today. I want to ask you about uh, three areas of policy concern, two of which are all three actually were in the initial statement. Uh, the conservation initiatives, the uh, issue of energy resilience, as well as uh, what you all keep referring to as BRAC. And so we're going to have a little challenging conversation on that. First, regarding uh, conservation, I was pleasantly surprised to see a lengthy section in your uh, written testimony about the uh, DOD's initiatives in this regard. Uh, I've re recently introduced a bill, it's called Recovering America's Wildlife Act. And interesting, you point out that there is a surge of potential endangered species being listed uh, coming, and that the DOD is oriented ex itself to participate in preventative measures in that regard. This is exactly what the Recovering America's Wildlife Act does, bipartisan initiative taking some monies that come from our uh, mineral uh, revenues federal off of federal lands and plowing it back into state wildlife management plans, which is a federal mandate. In Nebraska, we work voluntarily, giving landowners choice in this regard. But the DOD, as a part of your policy planning culture, should really take a look at this because it could help us create the continuity of habitat with existing public lands, as you're already doing, that addresses environmental species problems because once that starts, you're in the midst of litigation, the regulation moves to litigation, it's a horrible mess. So not many people win, not many communities win, the species don't necessarily win because it takes so long. So this is an innovative approach to, pro again, trying to provide the continuity of habitat by funding existing state initiatives <laughs> with federal uh, mineral resource revenues. And so it's actually being a good steward of the revenues that we have or the resources that we have, revenue extraction, back into resource recovery. So Recovering America's Wildlife Act, I'd like you again to be aware of this and to potentially incorporate it into your policy planning culture because it could greatly, I think, assist you in the larger goal. Our problem is we address this in small verticals rather than in a continuity. And uh, given the large footprint of the DOD, with, particularly with land holdings, this could be extremely helpful. So I'm, I'm very pleased that you raised this. In the, in the testimony. So can I have some mild commitment that you'll uh, integrate this into your policy plan? Right, so we'll definitely take a look at it. And, and as I said in my uh, written statement, we're working re really diligently with DOI uh, across the board I saw to, that. To, yes. see, to see what we can do to get in front and proactively manage. We're not in any way trying to uh, dismiss Endangered Species Act. We think it's absolutely critical. Well, this to is an attempt to move from, again, regulation and litigation right. to right. collaboration, yep. That's which ends up saving all of us a huge amount of money in the long run and actually achieves the mission of the Endangered Species Act. So it's a novel approach. But we're, we're working very consistently with what you're proposing there. Well, we're also working with the Department of Interior in this regard, so we may be back in touch. Yes, okay. Uh, energy resilience, uh, you have a 25% goal of use of renewable resources by 2025. How are we coming? Coming along. The I, best I, case uh, story out there, the best uh, return on investment. Do you have some case studies that are showing that could be scalable templates that have been implemented? We are continuing to look at all sources of energy. Uh, renewable is one source, but we're looking across the board. We definitely have a desire to want to take our yeah, goals. That's your mandate, 25 percent renewable by 2025. Right, we are working towards that goal, but, I, but I'll be honest with you, we are as concerned with providing security, uh, energy security to our most critical facilities. To what degree that goal is compatible with our overwhelming, desi compelling urgency to making sure our critical facilities can be powered. Okay, do you have case studies or actually implemented um, processes that could be scalable across the system that meet your goal for security and energy resilience, but actually is consistent with the broader mandate here. We are we are working a, across a whole range of efforts. But specifics. I need a sure, you example. Ask the service to provide specifics. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks for the question again and, and, and the support. So each installation is different because the environment is that. And I'll give you a good example of uh, energy security, and, and we're, do you remember, I have two military installations, Strategic Command and off at Air Force Base, so I, I, I get it. I yes, mean, sir. So, but I just back to specifics that oh. are might possibly scalable. I'm so, sorry, I'm just running out of time. I need to hurry along. Yes, sir. So, an example is, is Miramar, where we're taking methane off a, 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 right. a wasteland. Good. Uh, 
it's it we're we're, get, we're getting methane. We'll be putting a micro grid in there, mm -hmm. and we'll be able to. The, the, our our uh, goal is to operate off the grid. Okay, let me ask you this. That that's great. That, that that's very helpful. It, what is the process internally by which you are sharing best practices? Is there some continuity of initiative going on, or is it up to each base to sort of create its own culture in this regard? At the OSC level, we're working very closely with the services. It's every project that comes in, we're taking a look at where can we use that. Those lessons are in another project. Okay, I may come back to this in the next round because I'm running out of time, but thank you. Thank you. So we yes, hold, the, hold the thoughts. Let's unpack it a little bit further. Yes, One sir. more comment, Mr. Chairman, if you'll indulge me. Look, we keep t doing this. We keep using the, w it's now a word, BRAC. I, does anybody remember what it means? Yes, but now it's become its own word, like Xerox means copy. So we're, we need to move past this, okay? That was somebody else's idea 25 years ago. Not the intention, necessarily, but the way in which we speak about this, because we're not implementing it in this way. So I'm proposing this to you all, as I've proposed before previous panels for years, that we move away from the term, because the term causes such indigestion, okay? This is a new term. Miscellaneous. It stands for miscellaneous. Military Installation Savings Commission. It's a much less threatening kind of prospect, and it's consistent with what you all are already doing. And if I could, and maybe in the next round, and perhaps you said this earlier, I apologize because I wasn't here, but I'd like to know the excess inventory across all branches. So we could just have that in the forefront of our mind again. But when you start saying this closes, this closes, which is frankly not real in the environment we're up here, rather than, well, look, we've got this outbuilding here that could be sold to Lincoln Parks and Recreation and carved out. That's a higher and better use for the community. That's consistent with this, and it's a lot less frightening and, and it's more politically viable than the large-scale base realignment closure commission, which, again, it, that's just not reality. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Fortenberry. I have an acronym I'm going to share with you a little later. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Stop. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'd like to recognize the ranking member, Ms. Washman Schultz. Thank you, Ms. We're starting the second round of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just to put a bow on the end of my last series of questions, I had a chance to look up what the average cost, according to the Federal Register, is of incarcerating federal inmates. FY 2015 is the most recent year we have numbers for, $31,977.65, as opposed to a $1.7 million cost per detainee at Gitmo. A colossal waste of money and an example of backwards priorities. Um, <coughs> Mr. Secretary, I have questions for you about the border wall. Um, how would moving money from other priority projects, which we have already appropriated for in the omnibus bill, um, using existing DOD authorities to build part of the border wall, not circumvent Congress's appropriations authority, which was decided in the omnibus appropriations bill. We, we don't have a lot of ability to do that. Uh, we can use bid savings. Um, for instance, collectively, all the projects we executed, we have excess money. We could then you know, identify um, that as a source. Um, we do have a very limited ability to come with consultation with Congress. We would require us to come over and talk to you that if we feel we have a compelling need, that we can find lower priority projects um, and defer their execution. That's right, cancel them. Defer their execution, take those dollars, apply it to what we would have to convince you is a more compelling requirement, and then have the ability to backfill those projects in the future. What type of projects would the department not be able to execute if you choose to use that authority to execute a border wall? No, I, I can't say we would not execute. It would maybe defer. It would be it would be projects that we feel we don't have a compelling need to carry out in that year. What type? Oh I'm gosh, you um, for specifics. Uh, I, I couldn't tell you right now what, what specific project or what types of projects. Um, respectfully, if you already have been asked, as I know you have been, to draft potential options for how to move money to build whatever portion of the border wall you can, you do have an idea specifically of what kind of projects would not be able to be executed, would be delayed. Yes, ma'am. We, we have not been asked to get to that level of detail. All we're looking at is exploring what is even the range of congressionally, congressional law or congressional authorizations. What's that range? We, we, don't, we, Again, we haven't gotten to developing a list. If you know that 37 miles of the wall in Arizona would be built, mm -hmm. then you know what projects you would be moving the money from to be able to build that 37 mile, miles of wall because that's 
you, you, if you know where, where you would be able to build it, then you know from where you would take it to build it. We have not built a list of projects from prior years that we would defer, not cancel. And then more importantly, the first thing I'd want to do is look at um, prior year unobligated balances and apply that first. We don't have to change any priority. We don't have to affect any other MILCOM project. So what plans are you drafting then? It's more just exploring options. It's it's it really is looking at the range so of what authorities exist without any detail at all. Uh, not at this point, we've not been asked for more detail. Okay, that you understand that that doesn't make any sense, right? I mean, you you have to know where you're taking the money from, in order to know how much you're going to have to build what it is you're planning. So we laid out for the the the, the president a range of options of which he's chosen to deploy uh, forces to the to the border consistent with previous administrations. Um, the other uh, options really haven't gone on beyond gone beyond just hey they're out there. It's not we're, we haven't actually been asked to take any action do any planning. Okay. Um, the chairman and I just had an opportunity to go down to Puerto Rico to look at the impact that Hurricane Maria and Irma have had on the military facilities there. Um, th th they're in pretty bad shape. Yeah. Um, it is uh, really not good. Uh, one of the biggest issues that you have is energy resilience. They were out; they were without power for days. Yes, ma'am. Um, you really haven't mentioned Puerto Rico at all. What is it that you are doing to make sure that this key component of our defense infrastructure, which is resi power, energy resiliency, is a high priority? And as you know, Prepa. I mean, there's, there, there was a lot of concerns about the entire island, and, and, and they're in the process right now reassessing the entire utility infrastructure. Uh, and the Corps of Engineers has got a big part of that, planning long-term planning and ultimately how we increase resiliency for the entire uh, 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 island. Fort Buchanan had some redundant power sources. Those did survive, but it's still long-term. It may not be the answer. So that's part of what we're looking uh, across the board to the Department of Defense. Where can we enhance our energy security and resilience um, as opposed to uh, other other priorities. There were numerous stories that we've heard about how services are still using World War II era facilities. We saw some of those facilities. They were in bad shape to begin with. And, you know, we gave them the authority in the supplemental to build beyond just the existing, you know, standard. Um, how many World War II era facilities are there across the entire DOD enterprise? Yeah, I have to. I I, I would not don't know that off the top of my head um, how many older facilities we had. You know, a lot more historical, so they're still being well used. Um, so I would have to go back and pull you know, exactly the data pre World War II, which I assume we would note that are obsolete or no longer needed, is what you're looking for, right? I'll take I can take that for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Neumeyer. I was going to ask uh, quickly about. Uh, it's a mouthful. Uh, addressing PFOS and PFOA, I won't read the acronym. And by the way, on the acronym, I came up with one, didn't I? Sick. It's quite good, actually. Fort, <laughs> funding our readiness together, okay, <laughs> as opposed to this. <laughs> <laughs> Named it for Fortenberry, so, okay. Uh, but a brilliant chairman. <laughs> you guys have another side option if you quit your day <laughs> job. That took me 15 seconds. Coming up with acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but addressing the uh, PFAS and PFOA, DOD has uh, tested all 524 DOD-owned drinking systems worldwide. Uh, can you provide a list of the affected installations broken out by BRAC, active and reserve component, and what the appropriations accounts is responsible for funding that cleanup? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, sir, I can do that. And then uh, I can't do it right now. Yeah, but I understand. <laughs> so for the, at, at a later date, I understand. I didn't expect you to have that one at your fingertips. <laughs> but that's a very important issue to some of us and some of our communities where we've had these. Uh, it's a, it's an issue issues. which is we are spending so much time in the department on that, Mr. Chairman, uh, with the services uh, coming up with the right way to respond. Um, we would love to, you know, to continue to work with EPA. I think some of that requires a federal response on, uh, on how we're going to address that issue. Yeah, um, I'd like to now move. Uh, this is kind of more or less to all the witnesses before us today. Um, the fiscal year 19 budget request proposes a decrease of funding in uh, every reserve and guard component uh, construction account. Uh, the, uh, the guard and reserve uh, reserves have uh, pressing needs for access uh, control points and ranges uh, in some locations, um, uh, aircraft hangars. Uh, for example, the Air Force Reserve has uh, two hangars uh, and one main gate on the Air Force uh, unfunded priority list, and Air Force Reserve has one hangar and two small arms ranges uh, also on the unfunded priority list. Uh, of note, uh, the, the Army and active reserve components have uh, not submitted any unfunded priority lists at this moment. Um, how, can it be how can it be expected that the Guard and Reserve 
uh, to be properly trained if you're providing them inadequate resources for their facility? Maybe I start with the Air Force and we'll go back to the Army. We'll do it that way. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the budget, the, the resources provided for the Guard and Reserve are really mirror those provided to the active component. And so in this case, when we talk about a reduction in funds this year, it mirrors the reduction in funds that the active Air Force has. So it's really been about prioritizing amongst all of our ranges of missions uh, in, in accordance with the national defense strategy. So as we focused on readiness and lethality and, and modernization this year, we made choices that resulted in reduced accounts across the active guard and reserve components for facilities and infrastructure. Can you also answer this too? Are, are, there, are, there, um, are any of the projects on the unfunded priority list uh, for the Air Guard and Reserve uh, requested in the uh, future Air defense program, or are they truly unfunded requirements? And typically, we've brought forward items that were already in the future year's defense program, and I'd have to go back and look at each individual project. but. That's how we've done that on both the Active Guard and Reserve in the past, is if we can accelerate a program or a project as appropriate, that's what we choose to ask for your support in doing. And uh, I'd like, uh, General Bingham, would you like to add anything? Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Dent. Uh, as you mentioned, we did not submit uh, MILCON uh, on this, uh, on the CSA's UFR, uh list, uh, was not on it. Uh, I would tell you, though, that as a total Army, uh, the projects that we have in FY19 are well represented across both the Guard, Reserves, as well as the active component. And so uh, what we do, we prioritize those facilities as it relates to operational requirements, whether they be motor pools, uh, airfields, railheads, or the readiness centers in the case of the Guard and Reserves to make sure that we across the force uh, have what we need. Uh, anybody, either the Admiral or General, either you want to add anything on this issue? Sir, I, I don't know. I mean, we've got we're we're working on our NOSCs, um, and we've got consolidation projects. We're trying to bring on the fence line. Uh, there are no specific milcons this year for the NOSC. Okay. General, yeah. Yeah, Chairman, uh, I know just on sustainment, we've increased from 18 to 19 on on, on FISRIM for our more for res, and also uh, uh, construction. So it's pretty steady for us, and uh, no 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 decrease as far as. Uh, I have in front of me. I can get back to the exact numbers, though, sir. Okay. Thank you, General. Um, at this time, I'd like to recognize the uh, uh, General Lady from California, Ms. Ms. Lee. Thanks very much. Let me uh, ask uh, Secretary uh, Niemeyer about uh, the, the issue as it relates to um, waste, fraud, and abuse in general. Now, for years, I've been working with Congressman Burgess and other Republicans. We've been doing this in a bipartisan way to try to get it get an audit of the Pentagon. Uh, three years delayed now, who knows when it's going to be complete. The, uh, several years ago, it was reported in the Washington Post that maybe $125 billion in waste, fraud, and abuse, that report was somehow squashed. Uh, listening today uh, to the comments with regard to the border wall, the possible 69 million for maybe 41 or less uh, inmates in, in Guantanamo, uh, this upcoming military parade. I mean, you know, one of the reasons, and I don't vote for the defense budget. I vote for our budget generally here because um, this is more about our troops and quality of life. But um, how do you see this whole issue of waste, fraud, and abuse within your jurisdiction, and what can we do to make sure that um, we move the Pentagon along uh, if, if that's something that you can do? Because this is getting to be outrageous because it's taking away from quality of life um, priorities for our troops. So each of the services and, and the military departments, I mean, military departments and defense agencies are dedicated and working on right now. We have a, a process where we're doing internal audits. It's called FIRE. It's the acronym. Uh, we're, we're spending a lot of time and resources on trying to get to an audible financial statement for each of the services that we can present to Congress. Um, it is an effort which has been delayed. It's been going on for a while. Um, our goal here is to be as transparent, as accountable uh, for every dollar we spend. 
I know that's our priority right now. Secretary Mass has made it very clear to us. So we are committed to trying to get to an auditable financial statements for each defense agency. You saw DLA um, have theirs released a few months ago. Other agencies will follow. Services are not that far behind. Actually, Marine Corps is doing some good work. Um, and uh, so I, I, I think we're, we're getting there. It is definitely taking longer than the American people deserve or expect. Um, but we're making some good progress, particularly in the last two years, on trying to get to those account uh, financial statements. Are you having? Do you have any role in this upcoming quote military parade that this president is is presenting to the public for whatever reasons? He's uh, no, ma'am, I do not. You don't have any any. Uh, uh, I don't. You don't have any fiscal responsibility. No, ma'am. For this no, parade. Okay. Let me ask you with regard to your contracting. Uh, as it relates to uh, minority, women-owned, uh, veteran-owned businesses. I uh, am a former um, small business owner, 11 years, 8A contractor, and it was really hard to break in to uh, DOD and uh, wanted to find out right now how you're doing as it relates to uh, contracting and subcontracting with uh, minority women-owned and veteran-owned businesses. So my, my office works within the uh, Secretary of Acquisition Sustainment, and that's a top priority of, of Ms. Lord, is to take a look at what can we do to break down the barriers to have innovative young businesses, small businesses, come up with an adaptive acquisition framework where we can open the doors to some of these smaller businesses with their innovative ideas and come in and do business with the Department of Defense. It is difficult, not just for small businesses, for all businesses to have to enter into the bureaucracy of the federal acquisition regulations and other, other, uh, other forms and, and all kinds of things we impose upon our contractors. We are diligently working, not just for the, the bigs and the mids, but also those small businesses, to what degree we can incentivize them to want to continue to do business okay. in the department. Not just small businesses, mind yeah. you. Yeah. Do you know the distinction oh, yes, I do. between minority-owned businesses, yes, women-owned businesses, veteran-owned businesses, and small businesses? Because when you, if you have the reporting data, if you have the data, it will show, as many agencies show, that the small businesses uh, contracting and subcontracting may be a bit better than the contracting with minority-owned businesses, specifically African-American-owned businesses and women-owned businesses and veteran-owned businesses. So we have, we have, we track by categories, making sure we are meeting our quotas across the board um, for the full range of acquisition programs within DOD. Could you submit to us the um, report? Uh, yes, ma'am. And I'd like to see if you can uh, disaggregate the data uh, based on uh, gender and uh, ethnicity. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Fortenberry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General, I interrupted you, so if you'd like to continue your train of thought about uh, best practices uh, in terms of implementation of uh, sustainable energy projects, and then if someone would comment further as to how this is uh, discussed internally in terms of sharing templates or ideas. Just tell me the process. That would be helpful. Uh, so, so with the goal, and we've always had the goal, I mean, our installations are combat power, to project combat power in time and peace and, and support of national defense, period. And that's what we're out there for. So o over the years, we've, we've done some, I think, some really good uh, projects to afford us the ability to operate off the grid, whether it's pulling methane off the San Diego, uh, whether it's cogeneration plant, plant, plants at 29 Palms, which would uh, be able to operate off the grid, whether it's, whether it's Albany, Georgia, a depot, which we're basically uh, net zero down there. But it's about operating combat power. And each installation, depending, as you know, sir, whether you're in a, in a warm hemisphere area or a, a desert or a mountainous area, what renewables, what type of energy resiliency, uh, it applies more geographically than, than a, now we share that within, within, the, within the Department of Navy and then with OSD. So uh, I, think, uh, I think the information's out there. Now we just have to make the right investments, I think, to ensure not just the renewable energy, but that microgrid or ability or wheel energy around that base in order to generate combat power. Look, your, your comments are fair, that your mission is to keep us safe and you have to do that through the means that are available to you. However, because again, the footprint is, is so large and the investment is so big, sometimes what, by, by thinking constructively and creatively, you actually can, for the long term, 
enhance the ability to deliver a mission under adverse circumstances while also furthering a larger societal goal, and you're, we've talked about it here in terms of environmental protection, but also in terms of establishing uh, the next phases and generations of what we need to move to any, anyway, in terms of bridging to a more sustainable future. So it's not putting that fundamental mission on the DOD, but to the, to the degree you can partner with it and leverage it for your own sake, but also furthering this broad societal public good is necessary. That's why I'm trying to understand best practices that are out there and then the internal dynamics in which those are shared. From my perspective, looking from the outside in, dealing primarily with, not in this capacity, but in, in who I represent back home, it, it, we've just kicked off the initiative to try to create a working group around deeper exploration of how is geothermal possible, is wind where we are possible. So, solar is, has potential, but there's some complexities where I live. So can anyone address this? Yes, General. Thank you, Vice Chairman Fortenberry. And, and I'd like to comment uh, on when I talked about partnerships and, and working outside the gates, if you will. When you talk about it, think about energy security and resilience in the state of Hawaii right now. Uh, the Army has taken on a partnership with Hawaii Electric Company uh, for a 50 megawatt biofuel plant. And the intent of that is in the case of a natural disaster or power interruption, we are able to uh, sustain the whole of Schofield Barracks, Wheeler Airfield, Kania Field, and one of a local hospital for a period of 30 days. It's above the tsunami zone, and uh, we think that's a model uh, okay. partnership All right. well, that let, we've let's, explored. And I live in a state where there's public power, so it, sometimes it's a little easier for us to actually urge a municipal entity to partner constructively with another municipal entity, and that's what we're trying to do. But there's all types of uh, distributed generation options that are out there, and again, they might be able to incorporate, depending on circumstances, uh, sustainable energy models. Uh, I will also say that the Army and the Air Force actually collaborated their efforts. They took their energy options and combined into one. So they're taking the lessons learned every day, and they're applying them. And, and we're now we're looking at, okay, let's bundle more than one installation. Let's look at a range of missions to what we can do working with a local utility company on addressing the utility needs without just having to be in these stovepipes. So there's a lot of that collaboration going on right now within DOD. Okay, good. Yes, sir. So I was really going to echo the same thing. So the Navy has got an office that focuses on this. Uh, they also work collaboratively and share. Called the best. Energy Office? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. it, it, repo, Renewable Energy uh, Office. It's now actually Resiliency Office. It resides in the Naval Facilities Command. And we've got, uh, have done a lot of work over the past couple of years putting in projects. We've got continue, a lot of projects going on right now. I, I can e easily get you a list of what's been done and what's happening with specifics. Well, th that's okay. That's just more work for you guys but because I would just ask you to keep doing this uh, because it's important uh, for the broader reasons that we just discussed here. But again, I, I don't know if it's a mandate or a strong suggestion somewhere embedded in law, but it's by 2025, 25 percent. Now, I, I hear what you're saying about geographic diversity and it, it's got to be consistent with the fundamental mission. I get that. But I think it can be. So we're pushing on this back home as well, just to, to let you all know. So I, I may have officials at the installations that I work directly with come directly to you. Would that be all right, Mr. Secretary? Absolutely. Yes. Secondly, back to the uh, Military Savings, Military Installation Savings Commission. Uh, what is the, just a quick uh, summary of your excess inventory? across the branches. So, so we'll go from my end. Uh, the last reported savings that we had uh, was, was roughly 30 percent or excess. The majority of that, as I alluded to earlier, is really built upon ramps. And so we are right now working toward getting our arms better around facilities. So people normally associate facilities and excess facilities. And I don't have a good figure to give you. What do you mean on ramps? Literally, uh, the so, runway? So bases. So when we talk about ramps, it's where we park our aircraft. And so if you have uh, reduced the number of uh, aircraft in a wing over time or reduced the number of squadrons, then we have excess parking spaces. So, so that's a little harder aircraft. to deal with. So I think the types of things that we're yes, talking sir. about that what, can be spun off or sold yes, and integrated into the community in a constructive manner so you're not disrupting community life. Yes, sir. So what you're looking for, I don't have at hand right now to tell you. We'll come back and, and get you the best answer. So we that 30 percent figure includes these uh, excess ramps. Yes, sir. Well, the, these, these large infrastructure that 
in likelihood doesn't have a repurposed use for some type of community need. Yes, sir, that's right. correct. Sir, so part of it, I mean, we know right now what we have is if, if, just in Q3 and Q4, 17% or, or, or is in facility, uh, or Q3, 4 condition. The Q4, we would say we need to demo now. So there are about 733 buildings that we know we, we can get rid of now. But part of the infrastructure reset is, is recapitalization is, is as important or more, or more important sometimes than, than MilCon, uh, uh, taking that money from the MilCon, as opposed to new new platform from the MilCon. So as we're doing our, our basic facility requirements, so what is an infantry battalion rate space-wise? And that's where we're coming up. This is what you rate, and this is what you should, should have. And if you're a typical Marine, if you get a facility, you'll expand in that facility. You'll use it for martial arts, you'll use it for storage of equipment and things like that. So we have to come, we're coming up with standards, we actually have them now, and we're, we're consolidating Marines, moving Marines from barracks into, you know, consolidating, maybe they were spread out in two barracks and put them in one to get the occupancy rate. And then as we do that, then we can have either recapitalize that building for another purpose, or if it's not in good condition, to demo it. So right now we know low-hanging fruit, there's like 733 Q, Four buildings. So, so I think this question of excess inventory perhaps is too broad. There's a lot of subsets of this, as you're talking about that kind of infrastructure. Really transitioning to something else, minimal likelihood. So it, it, it has lessening and lessening value. Yours, you're talking about a consolidation of assets that you already have versus, in my mind, I'm thinking of again going back to BRAC, where you're actually spinning off or closing certain things, but rather than looking at it through that lens, how do you actually integrate those into some other community use? So I'm, I think that we need some subsets of what inventory, excess inventory means. I think that's... And, 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 and Congressman, also, it's not just savings, it's military value. Uh, the biggest part of the well, that's savings. process... Well, what I'm getting at is sense. that you, we have yeah, to assess the, what future value with those facilities will be to future missions. So we're having to do that level of complexity too. Okay, but one more one more moment, Mr. Chairman, if you would, but the, the general statistic as we have heard for many years, particularly from the Air Force, is you got 30% excess inventory. Well, what that implies is you've got wasted space sitting out there, we're just paying electrical uh, utility bills and or it's not meeting its highest and best use in terms of com re community repurposing. But it's not exactly right. That's what I'm trying to get to. What is the percent of assets that could be sold off, reintegrated into, or repurposed into another community use, or repurposed, as you're suggesting, into a higher value for the military itself? So we've been working on that. We, the Congress has given us authorities over 15 years to take an unutilized or suboptimized piece of property or a building and go ahead and spin it off. Go ahead and lease it, give it to somebody else, uh, get it out of off our inventory. We've been working at that. We've been working at demolition. So we've been, we, we have been exploring those other ways to reduce that number of excess facilities. We're getting to the point where all the long hanging fruit is done. Now we've got to get to a bigger process here that allows us to take a look holistically at the enterprise. Right. Thank you. Sounds like you're advocating for a BRAC, a MISC, or a Ford. Okay, so that uh, a miss. <laughs> miss. Okay. Uh, uh, I'd like to at this time uh, recognize the ranking member for any uh, closing comments she might have. No closing comments. Just uh, a motion to include this graph, which indicates MilCon as a percent of total DoD appropriation for the record. Well, without objection, then. Uh, I have other questions I will ask, but not today. I will send them uh, and submit them to you that you can then uh, send them back to us with uh, responses and the official record. So with that, uh, thank you all for being here, and this, uh, this committee meeting is adjourned. <laughs>